So on this, um, I, I wanted to put up here, I try to do this every day. This is what we're going to try to accomplish today. Uh, we're going to start with questions from the homework on Chapter 1 and the Chapter 2 skills review. And I'm, I have one example I'm going to do with you that I didn't get to last time. So I'll probably start with that and then see if you still have questions. And then today, the new material is Sections 2.1 and 2.2. And that basically covers two things, frequency distributions and graphs. And then after the break, we're going to talk about the how to show work quiz. I'm going to go look at that with you and show you how to do those things. And um, then I have a, a learning, we're going to talk about how to take a learning catalytics quiz. And the first one of those is available today. So I'll probably have to put an announcement in too, explaining the steps for doing a learning catalytics quiz, okay? So um, we'll get started. I think I'd like to show you first the problem I didn't get to in the chapter for the chapter skills, uh, chapter two skills review. There was a problem I didn't, I did not get an opportunity to cover with you because I ran out of time. And so what I'd like to do is share that with you now and talk about that particular problem because I know some people we're struggling with square roots. And then if you have another question, we'll do that. I will cut it off at a certain time on the questions to make sure we have time for the new material. But if you have extra questions or I didn't quite get to yours, then you, you can either stay on during the break and we can cover it then, or you can also stay after class for a little bit and we can cover it then as well. Um, that brings me to my office hours. I'm uh, kind of thinking about how I want to do my office hours, and I have them listed on my ICR, but I'm thinking about adjusting those a little bit. I'll probably do a time, a, probably a shorter time in the mornings to have morning office hours and then some afternoon office hours. And uh, while I'll have a Blackboard Collaborate session set up, what you'll, what you'll need to do if you need to talk to me is either email or call me so that I can join the session with you. But I will have sessions set up so that we can go in during those times. So um, I'm still kind of thinking through the whole office hours thing. This is the first time uh, I had to hold extensive office hours. In the summer, we only do a little bit of office hours. So. That's enough about that. Let's go on and let's look at this one problem. And I'm hoping this will help some of you if you had issues with the chapter two skills review. So looking at this problem here, and I'm gonna stop sharing my video so that, and if you wanna make this bigger, of course you can, um, Merge, you know, do the unmerge, click, click on that little circle next to the attendees and tell it to merge the panel. And that will make your screen a little bit bigger. You can also click on the um, magnifying glass and make it bigger. And so this was a problem, and I'm hoping that this will help some of you. This is a square root. I didn't get a chance to talk about square roots. So I'm going to talk a little bit about square roots, and then we're going to do this problem. So when you see something like this, you can do that in your calculator. But some of them you can do in your head if, if it's a perfect square. When, when you're asked to find, this means the square root of 25, what I've written down here. And if I wanted to find the square root of 25, what it's really asking is, what number times itself would give you 25? So the square root of 25 is 5 because 5 times 5 is 25. Now some some numbers are not perfect squares. For example, if I did the square root of 26, I can't get an exact answer for that because there is no number times itself that gives you 26. 
but I can do that in my calculator. If I do that in my calculator, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing this in my calculator now. And usually in your calculator, the square root function is you have to do second, and it's usually above the x squared button. And then you put in the number. And when I do the square root of 26, I get 5.0990. And this one says, in the instructions for this one, it says approximate the answer to two decimal places. So let's just follow that rule here for this one. This is not the answer to this question, by the way. I'm just doing an example here, and then I'll erase it, and we'll do this problem. But if it wants me to approximate the answer to two decimal places, so that uh, that first nine is the second decimal place, so basically everything's going to cut off after that. Since that next number is five or bigger, though, I have to add one to that number in the rounding place. When I add one to it, it becomes 10. So this would be 5.10. And I would normally keep the zero just to indicate that that answer has been rounded to that second decimal place. It's like a notification to whoever's looking at it that that's, the round, that's where it's been rounded. OK, I'm going to erase that. I'm going to go back to the original problem. So this is the problem. Hold on. Let me get it. When you see the square root of basically a fraction like this, the whole thing is under the square root. Sorry about the squiggly lines. And I could do that top part. I'm going to do some of it. If I do 1.3 and hit the X squared button, that gives me 1.69. I'm going to try to do this. So the 1.3 squared gives me 1.69 plus when you square a negative, that's going to be a negative times a negative, which will be positive. Same thing with the negative 0 0.3. 0 0.3 squared, negative 0.3 squared and 0.3 squared are both 0 0.09. 1.4 squared is going to be 1.96, I believe. Yes, 1.96. Pin. And then 1.7 squared is 2.89. And all that is divided by 5. So you have to do the addition, all that addition on top. I'm going to come down here because I ran out of room. I'm going to do all that addition on top because even though division would normally go before addition, but when it's a fraction, that means you look at it as a numerator divided by a denominator. So I've got to add these numbers. When you add all those numbers on the top, it gives you 12.88. And then that's divided by 5. And then you're going to do that division before you do. Oh, first it wants the answer in square root form. OK, so I've got to do that before I can. Before I can um, round, it wants the division. Notice it wants it in square root form. This is what they want you to do. At this point, they want you to split it. And there's a rule that says when you take the square root of a fraction, you can take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. And then, and I would not ask you to do this on a test. And in statistics, I'm not real sure why they asked you to do this A part, because normally you would just punch that in and get an answer and, and round it. But since they want it in square root form, 
That means they want you to get rid of that radical on the bottom, and the way you get rid of it is multiplying by square root of 5 over square root of 5, because that gives you square root of 25 on the bottom. And then you can multiply radicals. So on the top, I'm doing 12.88 times 5 is 64.4 on top. Sorry. 64.4 on top, and on the bottom I get square root of 5 times square root of 5, which is square root of 25, which is just 5. Notice it's not square root of 5 now, it's just 5. This is called rationalizing the denominator, and they do this because math people don't like radicals on the bottom. This is probably what they want as the answer, because I doubt square root of 4, I doubt that 64.4 is a perfect square, but I'm going to check just in case. So if I do the square root of 64.4, no, it's not a perfect square. So this is the best I can do for the A part, is the square root of 64.4 over 5, which is the same thing. It would also be the same thing as 1 -fifth times the square root of 64.4. Like I said, I don't know why it's asking you for the square root form. Really, the B answer is the important thing. So now I would take that square root of 64.4, and that ended up being 8.024. And notice I'm carrying this out a bunch of places, and then I'm going to divide that by 5. And the reason why you want to carry it out a bunch of places is because you don't, you should never round. And this is this is an important thing to talk about in statistics. You should never round anything until you get your final answer. So I'm leaving the whole not the whole big old decimal number in my calculator. I'm going to divide it by 5. And then that gives me 1.6049 and now I'm going to round to two decimal places. And that 0 will stay a 0 because the number after it is only a 4. You do not like start at the 9 and round back. You just look at just that number. The, those numbers don't matter. OK, so this would be the final answer. So I'm hoping that helps a little bit with the square root problems. Um, someone was asking me, where are some places you can go to get extra information? And so I think I'd like to show you some places. I lost you for a second. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I'm back. So um, some places you can go to to get extra help on things. Um, you might try, well, there's a lot of videos and PowerPoints and information in my math lab. So for those of you who are interested in finding that, how to get to those places. I'll go over that later in the second part of the class. And um, another place, uh, another place you might try is um, Khan Academy. And that's a place you could try for extra help. Um, but there is a lot of stuff in my in my stat lab in your Pearson account that you that you're paying for or will pay for. Don't forget you have to pay for it within the first within the two weeks. Okay, so I'm going to unshare this problem so that on the recording it will show us. And also, I'm going to, I want to see the, hold on just a second. There. 
So I, ho I hope that helps a little bit with the square root problems. If you still have a question about the chapter two skills review, let's have those questions um, for the most part during the break. But we could probably do one more if you have one you're really stuck on. I got a email from a couple of you about these. So if you have a particular one you'd like to go over, we can do that now. I'll do one more. If you have one more you'd like to go over right now, you can type it in the chat. Um, what I'm doing is I have another. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Oh, okay. So I did chapter one, but I was trying to. Um, get into chapter two, but it wouldn't let me access it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the chapter two. For the work, chapter two work. Yeah, the chapter two work. It will be available um, today. OK, I see. Yeah, and I'm just going to double check on that. I think I, yeah, the homework is, the homework is available now for chapter two, so you'll be able to get to it. Did anybody have a question about um, that chapter one homework or the chapter two skills review? We could do one more before we move on to uh, 2.1. Um, Ms. Haley, I have a question about uh, number 22 on the chapter two review. Okay, let me, I'm gonna pull it up. Okay, in case it's long. You know, something kind of long. You said number 22? Yes. Okay, that's very much like the one I just did, except it has an app in it. So, um, just to show you mine, they give you a formula like this, and it says the sum, remember, this means sum. Mm -hmm. over n okay and what they're telling you on this oh, one sorry. yes is that I'm not sorry it? it's not it's not that one no it's one that has an x and like two lines um on both sides of the x okay i'll look for that if any of you had trouble this was number 22 though if any of you had trouble with this Basically, you have to put the numbers in. They tell you what to use for n. Like they say on this one that n is 9. And they tell you what mu is. Mu is uh, 35.84. And then they give you all the x's. So you have to take, you have to take each x. And this is a long problem. I'm not going to lie to you. This is one of the longest ones we do for the whole semester. But we are going to do this when we get towards, when we get in some of the later sections of chapter two. So this is a calculation you need to be able to do. So basically what you're doing is you're taking each X, like the first X it gives me is 35.2. That's in the table. So I have to subtract mu and square it. This means I'm going to add, and now I'm going to go to the next one, and I'm not going to show all of them. I know this isn't your question, Mia, but since I put it up here, I feel like I need to at least show people how to get started. So you add all of them up, you do this, all of the X's that they've given you, and then you divide that by nine. And then you're going to end up with a bunch of numbers squared, added together, just like the problem I just showed you. Okay, so Mia, you're asking about, you said it was a problem. Let me see if I can find one like what you might be looking it might, at. It might be 23 because it was right after that problem. Yeah. Number 23, I'll, let me write my number 23 up here on the board. And you can tell me if this is what you were seeing. It says evaluate the expression. So this is 23 in the chapter 2, and I'm going to call the skills review SR. Okay. And it says, it 
Yeah. So is it, does this look right, Mia, like what you're thinking about? Yeah, that looks like it. Okay. These lines like this are called absolute value. And absolute value is distance from zero. If you think about it on a number line, like here would be zero, and your positive numbers would be over here, your negative numbers would be over here. If I take the absolute value of two, that's like saying, how far is two from zero? Well, it's two units, so the absolute value of two is two. And when you take the absolute value of negative two, that's also two because its distance from zero is also two. So distance is always positive. That means absolute value is always positive. That means that part of the problem is positive. That right there, if the problem had been that, it just would have been 0 0.699. That's how far that number is from zero. But this negative, so point, the negative on the outside of the absolute value, though, is going to make the answer negative because it's on the outside. Okay? So, so it's going to be just turned into a positive. Yeah. Now, let me show you something. So, yeah, it's like the absolute value makes the number positive no matter what it is. The number inside. So let me show you. What if I did this? What would that be equal to? This is a different problem. Okay? So let's let's forget this thing on the outside. That right there is still 0 0.699. Because those bars mean how far is this number from zero? Well, its distance from zero is the same as the distance of Six nine nine. But then this right here is going to make the answer negative. So it's like the neg if there's a negative on the outside, it carries down. But a negative on the inside will disappear. Okay. So All right. That helps. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. So this was the big thing, though, is knowing that absolute value is distance from zero. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, we're going to do, if you have more questions from the skills review or from the homework from chapter one, uh, please stay on during the break and I will cover more of those questions during that 30 minute break. And we're going to go on to 2.1 and 2.2. And the topic that we're going to be covering is frequency distributions and graphs. So we'll talk definitely get through the information about a frequency distribution and we may or may not get through all the different graphs that we can make from a frequency distribution, but we'll try. All right. So um, first, let's talk about a frequency distribution is I'm going to share the beginning of the PowerPoint for this just because it looks neat, neater than what I write. So notice we are doing now descriptive statistics. And in this first section, we're going to talk about organizing data, collecting and organizing data, and making a frequency distribution from it. And we're going to talk about graphs. Today, we're only going to cover sections 2.1 and 2.2. First, section 2.1. So a frequency distribution is, is sort of like a spreadsheet, really. It's just a chart where you uh, organize data that you've collected. 
And we're going to actually do some data and just uh, collect some data in just a minute. So I'm going to show you a few quick things about frequency distributions, and then we're going to make our own frequency distribution. So, and these, I don't, I'm not showing you the entire PowerPoint. So if you want to see examples, the PowerPoint is longer and it has examples and stuff. And you can find PowerPoints, videos, and um, the book under media in the media, the M assignments. You can also go to go to multimedia library in the menu of my stat lab. And in that multimedia library, you can find all kinds of videos. I'll show you guys how to do that um, like uh, right before the break or right after the break. So here, a frequency distribution is like a chart. This is a really small frequency distribution. So it's just a table. It shows classes or intervals of the data. And then it shows you how many of the data values fall in each class. For example, on this one, we can see that whatever these numbers are, in the class from that includes the numbers 1 through 5, there are five data values in that class. And then the class that goes from 6 to 10, there are eight data values there. It just tells you how many data values there are in each of these intervals. And the number of data values is called the frequency. I'm going to do this with you. We're going to do an example in just a minute. So I'm just showing you a quick overview. Then we're going to do our own example. So each class has a lower class limit. That's the smallest number in the class and an upper class limit. So you can see here where they've boxed the lower and upper class limits. An important part of a frequency distribution is the class width. Now I want you to notice that these classes are all the same size. That's important. So when you talk about the top class 1 to 5, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's five numbers in that class. So, And then I want you to look at this. If you look at one low limit to the next one, from 1 to 6 is a difference of 5. And then you see from 6 to 11 is a difference of 5. Let me get my pen so I can show you what I'm talking about. Do it, send us a different color. So you see from 1 from the number 1 to the number 6 is a difference of 5. From 6 to 11 is a difference of 5. From 11 to 16 is a difference of 5. From 16 to 21. Can everybody see that as you go from one low limit to the next low limit, just ignore the upper limits for now. Just ignore those. The distance from one low limit to the next one on this one is 5. So we say here that the class width is 5. And they got that by doing 6 minus 1. But notice they could also have found it by doing 11 minus 6 or 16 minus 11. So basically, it's the distance between the lower class limits. And we're going to collect some data, real data. OK, we're going to collect some real data and we're going to make a real frequency distribution from it. And we if we have time, we'll make some real graphs from it. I've given a lot of thought to this. So what I want is numerical data and I'm going to do this with you. So I'm going to join in this experiment with you. So. So here's what I thought of. I hope it's not too boring of an example for you. But I wanted to think of something that was somewhat related to what's going on this semester, being online and everything. Um, but you don't want to collect any personal data. So everybody's going to give me a number. Here's the number you're going to give me. So for our data, And I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this because you might not know the answer right away. You might have to Google this in your phone or on your computer. So you might have to go to another tab. But I want you to use, you can use maps or something. And I want you to find the distance 
I don't want you to tell us where you live, okay? I'm not gonna tell you where I live, but I'm gonna do this also. We're gonna do the distance from our houses, our address, or wherever you're watching this from. Maybe it's not your house. Maybe you're watching it from a parent's house or a friend's house, that's okay. Uh, but you can do the distance either from your house or from wherever you're at right now to South Campus, which is normally where I would be teaching this class is on South Campus of TCC. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to get an idea of how spread out we all are. Because ordinarily, some of you would never have taken a class at South Campus. Maybe if you live up on the north side of town, you might have taken it at northeast. Or if you lived on way south, you might have taken it at southeast, like if you lived in Grand Prairie. So all I want is the distance. This should be a number in miles. So see, I'm looking for a number. This is quantitative data, numerical, um, from your house or address. We'll just call it home, wherever you want to count that from, to South Campus and the address to South Campus. I mean, you might be able to put in TCC South, but I'm going to give you the address. It's 5301 Campus Drive. Fort Worth. That's the address for South Campus. So I'm going to do this in my phone also. Find out. I know I'm not very far. I'm probably about six miles, I'm guessing now. But I'm going to actually do it. We're going to get real data. So I want everybody to do this. Take a couple of minutes and go to your computer or your phone and find out how many miles you are from South Campus. So I'm going to give you um, about Let's see what time it is. It's 11.03. Let's, it shouldn't take us more than a couple of minutes. So say 11.05. Once you find your number, just raise your hand and leave it up, and I will know that you are done. Oh, some of you are fast. It's going to take me a little bit of time. And mine gave me a decimal. I'm going to put the data on this other board here. So I'll put mine on here. Mine was, oh, it's pretty close. I'm going to put it on this board so that we can use it for various things. And I'll use this to check roll because I'm going to assume if you have an answer here that you must be there. So as you raise your hand and leave it up because I'm going to call on you in a minute to find out what the num what your distance is. So just leave your hand up. When everybody's done, we will gather our data are very exciting data. This one may not be that exciting, but it's not nearly as boring as some of the other ones I thought of. People, temperance, Layla. I'm just calling your names that I see your hand, the ones I see the hands up, Jacob. Your hands are already up, so Ariana. Chloe, you can do yours if you want to, but you don't have to. Can't. Um, I still have two more. Okay, leave your hands up when once you get it. And Kendra, are we getting Kendra's distance from the school? And Samira, Samira, are you there? Okay, 
And so I think we have one more if Kendra wants to add her data in how far she is from South Campus. That would just give us more data. And uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to give Kendra keep keep ha, Kendra keep looking for your distance from South Campus. We'll go ahead and put everybody else's data on here. So if you can turn your microphone on, turn your mic on and tell me as I call your name. And once you tell me or type it in the chat, one or the other, then you can put your hand down. So first, let's do. We'll start at the top there, Diamond. How far are you from South Campus? Eleven miles. Eleven. Okay. Okay, so you can put your hand down. Mia, how far are you from South Campus? 38 miles. Wow. Are you in the same state, Mia? Yeah, I'm in Dallas. Oh, okay. Stephanie Garza. Okay, you can put your hand down, Mia. Stephanie Garza, how far are you from South Campus? 6.1 miles. 6.1, okay. Okay, that was Stephanie, right? So Stephanie, you can put your hand down. Christina, how far are you? All right, I am 9.6. 9. 9.7. 9. Notice that our numbers at, on my map, it gave me to the tenth place also. So our data is going to go to the tenths place. That's good because that'll show us what to do with that type of data. Um, okay, Christina, you can put your hand down. Cecil, how far are you from South Campus? 2.9 miles. Oh, you can almost walk. Okay, put your hand down, Cecil. Temperance, how far are you? Temperance, I'm not hearing you. You can type it in the chat if, it, if it's not coming through. No, I'm not hearing you, Temperance. Okay, thanks. 11. Okay, you can put your hand down. Layla, how far are you? I'm five point miles. Five point three. Three. Thank you. And Jacob? No, uh, six point eight. Six point eight. Okay, you guys, uh Layla and Jacob, you can put your hands down. Ariana, how far are you? Two point eight. 2.8. I was hoping it would all fit here. It's not. Um, you can put your hand down. And Samira, how far are you? 4.6. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. 4.6. Got it. 4.6. Okay, so here's my data. Um, Samira, you can put your hand down. Have you put down mine yet? No. No. What it, what, what's, um, what's yours, Kendra? Five, five miles. Five miles. Okay. I'm going to put yours up here because I ran out of room. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, sorry. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. No, sorry. That was five miles. Yes. Five. Okay, great. So um, I like that we have this 38 in here because this is going to give us a, a wider range of values. So let's suppose we wanted to make a frequency distribution that was going to show how spread out in the frequency of different classes. Well, the first thing we would need to do is come up with a class width. So I'm going to talk about that. And so I, I think I'm going to put that on here so I can move it. If I wanted to do the class width, in other words, I want to see how big the classes should be. They should all be the same size in the frequency distribution. Then the way I would do that is I first figure out the difference between the biggest and the smallest, and that's called the range. 
and I would divide by the number of classes that I want. So range is the biggest number, bigs minus the smallest number. So the biggest one is obviously the 38 miles, and it looks like the smallest one was 2.8. In other words, I'm finding how far the, the biggest and smallest are from each other. Now for the number of classes, if they ask you to make a frequency distribution, they're gonna tell you how many classes they want. Typically, the number of classes is somewhere between five and seven. We're gonna do five just because it's less work for now. So we're going to do five classes, and that would be given. That number would be given to you. So then I'm going to divide by five. And so on here, and notice our data values are to the tenths. So really, our class limits should match that. So, and I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking at my phone. I should be looking at a calculator. Okay. So I'm doing 38 minus 2.8. I'm going to divide that by 5, and that gives me 7.04. Now let's think about this for a second. That's how wide our classes should be. We are going for our class width, we are going to round to the nearest. In this case, um, since we're doing tenths, we're going to round up, never down. So we're going to round to match our data. Since our data is to the tenths place, some of them are. If, if there was one that was to the hundredths place, we would do that. But since some of the data goes to the tenths place, a bunch of them do, we're going to round our class width to the uh, tenths place, and with class width, you always round up. So we're going to say round up, and we're going to round to the tenths place, one decimal place to match. We're going to round to the tenths place to match the data. This is our data. So if I was rounding the 7.04 to the tenths place, if you were rounding it normally, you would round it to 7.0 because that next number is not five or bigger. But since we are um, rounding up always, we're going to use a class width of 7.1 for our class width. I'm rounding up. I'm rounding my my rounding place. I'm rounding it up. It's a different than just rounding. We do this with um, frequency distributions. We always round up on the class width just to make sure all of our numbers will be included and that we don't have to create a sixth class. Um, most of the time, class widths are whole numbers more often than not. I'm just doing this just so you can get an idea. You might sometimes see it rounded to the tenths place. So I'm going to take that off for a second. I did this for a reason so that we could create. So we've got real data. It's a sample, obviously. It's not even the whole class. So for the sample size, let's write that down. which remember is little n, and let me see how many we have in our sample. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 numbers in our sample. So I'm just going to write that down. And then we're going to make a chart, a table. The first column is going to be class limits. So let's look at the class limits. Usually on your class limits, you start with your lowest value. That's where the first class starts. So our lowest number was 2.8. Now,
Now what we're going to do is we're going to find all the low limits first by adding the class width. Remember our class width we decided should be 7.1. So we're going to come back over here and we're going to add 7.1 to get the next low limit. When we add 7.1 to that, the next low limit would be 9.9. .9. Then if I add 7.1 to that, so I'm going to do this in my calculator because I'm not great at adding in my head, would be that comes out even to 17. So I'm just doing the low limits. Plus 7.1 is 24.1. And when what I add. The, I have a question. Yes? On the class limits, when you wrote on the side column, what is the red? It's hard to see. It oh, it's a, it's a 7.1. That's our class width that I'm adding to get each low limit. So let me see if I can make that look a little better. So for each low limit, like to get from the 2.8 to the 9.9, .9, I'm adding that class width that we came up with. Remember, we came up with that by taking the, the range of the values and dividing by um, how many classes we wanted. So we have one, two, three, remember we wanted five classes. And so the way we get from, and this is the, we start with the smallest number here. So 2.8 is the smallest number. And then we're going to get from here to here, we're adding 7.1. And then we do that over and over again. We just keep adding 7.1. And these here are our low limits. Now to get the upper limits that go in this column, it would be we're going one before this one. So if that this one starts at 9.9, .9, this one ended at 9.8. Remember, we're doing to the tenths place on these. So right before 9.9 .9 would be 9.8. Right before 617 would be 16.9. And these are going to be the upper limits for the class. And the way you get those, you, you can still get those by adding 7.1. They will also be 7.1 miles apart, just like the low limits were. So I can get the, I don't have to look at what the next one is. I can just take the 16.9 and add 7.1. And then I can add 7.1 again and add 7.1 again. And notice this last one is 38.2, and hopefully that includes, yes, that includes our biggest value. This is why you want to make sure your class width is big enough. That's why we round up instead of just round, to ensure that every data value falls into one of these classes. Okay, there is another, the second column usually is class boundaries. And I'm going to save that for a little bit. Okay, and we're going to go on and talk about frequency. I'll come back to class boundaries later. Oh, I'm sorry, not frequency. We need to do a tally column and then frequency. We're going to do tally. Sorry about that, guys. Tally. And then we'll do frequency which is basically counting the tallies. So guys, we're just trying to rep we're trying to represent the data that we just came up with in a chart form. And from the chart, we're going to try to make graphs to represent that data. So, 
when we do tally, tallies are things like this. You know, like you keep score. So that's what a tally is. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take this data and I'm going to tally. I'm going to put it down here so I can see it. And for each data value, I'm going to make a tally in the correct class. So I think I'm going to draw lines like this so I can keep my classes straight. And guys, there's one problem in the homework where you have to do all of the steps for this. There will probably be a problem like that on the test. So I'm spending extra time on this to make sure you know how to do all these parts. I didn't give a lot of problems in the homework like this because they're time consuming, but there will be one like this on the test that will be worth quite a few points. So make sure you know how to do the different things in each column. I can't remember which problem it is, but I'll tell you after the break if you, uh, well, you'll find it. It's, it is, it's not at the very end because the graphs are at the end. Okay, so when I do the tally, so my first number, actually it was Kendra's number, was five, and that would go in this first column. You see that's between 2.8 and 9.8. I'm going to mark it off so I'll know, I'll put, I'm going to put a little check by it so I'll know I did that one. The next 7.1, that was mine. Then I had 11. 11 falls into this class. Then I had 38. That falls in this class. 6.1 falls into this class. I have a feeling we have a lot in that. 9.7 also falls in that class. I think we're all going to be in the first class. 2.9 is... Notice is, a, is the fifth one that I've gotten in that class. Then I have 11. Then I have 5.3. I'm going to have to make my marks smaller. 6.8. 2.8. And 4.6. Unfortunately, we're all in, there aren't any in these two classes. So I did. Okay, so now I'm not sure. I know those last two went in that top class, but I'm not sure if I got everybody. So I'm going to count these tallies. Remember, they should add up to 12. So 5, that's 9, 10, 11, 12. Yeah. Notice these two classes are empty. Nobody was in them. And that's okay, but it's going to make for a weird looking graph because you can't leave those out. When you make a graph, if you're going to compare and look at data, you can't leave out classes just because there's nobody in it. So we have two blank classes. So unfortunately, you guys actually were pretty close to South Campus. Maybe you would have taken my class even if it hadn't been online. That's okay. <clears throat> We could make up some more data values just to have them in there, but we'll just, this is real. This is real data. We'll just go with it. So now for frequency, you're just going to add up the tally. So this one, we had nine people in this class and two, zero, zero, and one. And those numbers should add up to your sample size. So if I add those up, if I add up the frequencies, there's 11. 12 and we can see that's a way to check and make sure you accounted for everybody okay let me check the time real quick Note. all right um another column that we would have here and I'm, I'm going to leave this up we're going to do the last two columns and we'll come back and do class boundaries and graphs right after the break so um Here, let me do this. We need, we're going to have a midpoint column. Actually, there's three columns. Midpoint, relative frequency, and cumulative frequency. Okay. 
Now, these different things, the midpoint, the frequency, relative frequency, cumulative frequency, these are just things that you can keep track of, and they are different graphs that show different things. So by doing this, we'll have all the information we need to make any kind of graph. So I'm going to do fill out as much of this as I can. Um, I wish I had a bigger board. I'm going to do as much of this as I can uh, before the break. So to get midpoint, what you're doing is you're adding the upper and lower limits. You're averaging them. You're finding the middle point. So to find the midpoint, you do the high, the low, plus high for each class, and divide by 2. So for this first one, I'm adding 2.8 and 9.8. If you're doing your calculator, you should put it in parentheses like I did there. 2.8 plus 9.8 divided by 2 gives me 6.3. Your midpoints will be the class with the part two. So you can you can average those for every midpoint, or you can take this one and we can just add 7.1 over and over again. So I'm gonna do that real fast now that I've shown you how to do one. Just so we can do the rest. And then I'm going to leave this up during the break, so if you have any questions, we can do it. Relative frequency. That's like the percentage that's in each class. So basically what you do for relative frequency is you take the frequency, F, for each class, and you divide it by N. This is F over N. And we're going to round this. This is going to be a decimal number usually. So like I'm going to show the work for the first one. For the first one, it would be 9 out of 12. But we're going to express this as a decimal number to two places. So that's 0.75. And that's the relative frequency. And that means 75% of us were in the first class. That's what that meant. Then for this one, I'm doing 13.4 out of 12. I'm sorry, 2 out of 12. Sorry, it's the frequency. So you're ignoring the midpoint. You're coming back here to frequency. This is your F here. 2 out of 12. And that comes out to be 0.16 repeating. So I'm going to round that to 0.17 because I'm going to do these to two places. These had frequencies of 0, so that means their relative frequency is also 0. And then the last one is 1 out of 12. which is 0 0.08. Okay, I'm, I'd like to finish up but with cumulative frequency, and then I'll take questions during the break. I want you guys to be able to take a break, too. So, um, Kendra, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. I'm trying to... Well, because with zero, um, yeah. you can't change that one to zero, can you? Yes. That one? Zero, you have zero divided by 12, which would still give you zero. So for all of these, you're for, for relative frequency, you're always doing the frequency divided by n. And for all of these, n is 12. Does that answer the question? Um, yes. OK. Now, I'll finish up the cumulative frequency, then I'll stay on and answer any questions that anybody has. For cumulative frequency, that's like saying, when you get to the end of this class, how many data values have you included? So for the first one, when we get to the end of this class, we've included nine data values. In other words, before we start the next class, we already have nine. When we add on the next class, we accumulate two more. So it goes from 9 plus 2 gives us 11 for the cumulative frequency. Then we don't add anything 
So this is 11. Then we don't add anything on this one. So that's 11. And then we add 1. And so that gives us 12. And this last cumulative frequency should be the same as the num total number of values. Because when you get to the end of the last class, you should have accumulated or gone through every data value. So that number should always match that. Okay, I'm going to stop there, but I'm going to leave this up so that if you need to look at it, and I'm going to stop the recording here. Um, well, we'll see if you have questions. If you have questions, I'll keep recording, but you can take a break now. If you don't have any questions about this, go ahead and, and take a break, get a snack. If you want to start on the homework, if you want to start on this problem, let me, uh, let me see if I can figure out which problem it is. And I'll let you know in case you want to get started on that one, because that's the heart. That's the longest one. Um, I think it's number 11 in the homework. Eleven will be a good one to try anyway. I thought there was one where you had to fill out all of them. Anyway, go ahead and take your break. If you have a question, turn on your mic or type in the chat. Christina, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. We already covered yes. 21. We already covered 21 and I've got the steps down. My question on those that little find the estimation. That's my question. The actual plugging in the numbers in the scientific calculator. I guess that's the problem. I don't know how to arrive or get the estimate, I guess. Well, what is that? Uh, what, what homework assignment are you looking at? Christina? That was the previous week. That was, again, number 21. And we've gone over the steps. I've got the steps. I've got the actual number part mm -hmm. right. It's just that last little step when I go to punch in the numbers in the scientific calculator to arrive at the estimation. I don't know what I'm punching wrong on my calculator. So I guess that's the steps that I need. You said second at the very, very top of the class. You said press the second button, but then we moved too quickly and I didn't get the steps. Oh. Was it a square root problem? Yes. Okay, so when you do your square root, tell me what you have under the square root. I had, um, it was 12.64 over 5. Had you rounded that at all? Yes, the original was 63. Don't round. Oh. Yeah, don't round that, okay? So what was it originally, 12 point? No, originally it was 63.2 over 25. Oh, 63.2 over 25, which is how we got 12.64 over 5. Okay, hold on. You had... Um, 63.2, had you rounded that? No. Okay. So it was like this. No, right? it was 63.2 over 25. And over then you 25. said, yes. And then you said to multiply it by five. Okay. Okay. Go back. Because I think the original denominator, was it not five to start with? Yes. Okay. That's what I need to go back to. So okay. when it was over five, what did all those numbers on the top add up to? It was 12.64. Oh, uh, gosh, I'm looking at my work. Ah, 12.39 plus 0.25. So, yeah, 12.264 is what they all added up to. And it was over five at that point. Yes. Okay, now when we, we split this, it 
and multiply by square root of 5 over square root of 5. Okay, I'm just trying to make sure I get everything the way you had it. And that gives us 12.264 times 5, 61.32 on the top. Yes. And that's going to be over square root of 25, which is 5, correct? Yes. Okay, so what we have to do is we're going to find the square root of 61.32. Yes, yes, and that's the, where I was having problems putting inputting it in my scientific calculator. So on my calculator, I don't know what kind of calculator you have. Very uh, similar to yours. Very okay, similar. so if I wanted to do this problem here, I would do, I see the square root is the second function on my x squared button. Yes. And so I'm going to do second x squared, and it gave me a square root. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. I'll try to hold it up close. Yes. So far we're matching. And then I'm going to put in the 61.32, and I'm going to close the parentheses. And it's important that you close those parentheses. How did you do that, though? How did you even get to the parentheses? Well, if your calculator doesn't open parentheses to start with, you're going to have to put it in. Or you can do the square root of 61.32 and hit equals and then divide by 5. One or the other. So you can either use parentheses or you have to do it in pieces. But so if your calculator, when I do second, watch what happens. When I do second square root, notice it auto, my calculator automatically opens up parentheses. And if yours does not, then you can stick the parentheses in, or you're going to have to do this in pieces. You solved the problem for me. Okay, thank you. Okay. So um, the point is, is that if you don't have print, if you're going to do it all in one, if you, at this point, if I don't close the parentheses, what that's doing is it's saying, only take the square root of that number and then divide that answer by five. But if you don't use parentheses, it tells it to take the square root of the quotient of the whole thing, and it makes the five under the square root. Got it. That's why I wasn't okay. answer. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, let's see. Mia, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, so everything that you have on the board um, behind, I guess the bigger board, um, I don't know if it's because it's kind of smaller um, on it's my screen. It's confusing. Uh-huh. Uh, is there a problem like this on the homework that you could put so that, I don't know, um, it can make it easier to understand? Um, there is a problem like this in the homework. And then there should be a video or a click on view an example or help me solve this, and they will go through it step by step. Did you try making this big? Are you able to make the board big and take up the whole space? No, it's not. Um, it's not letting me make the screen bigger. You should be able to. Oh, can you make me take up the space, or are you seeing four people? I'm um, seeing five people. I can only see you um, when you put in an attachment and then I click on your screen. Okay, you should be able to follow the instructor and make me big because that's what it's going to look like on the on the recording too. It's going to be big on the recording. So there should be a way for you to either click on that little picture okay. of me or click on follow the yeah, instructor. It's not like yeah, I'll just watch your video then, because um, it's not letting me make your screen bigger. So it's confusing. Is any, can anybody help else help with that? Is anybody else finding a way while I'm teaching to make the screen big? Just on you. Just touching. Just, just touching on your face. It'll make it bigger on my end. Okay, which it or would clicking, imply you're clicking, clicking, which would imply that you you can click on it. If you're touching it, that means. Yeah. 
Yeah. I keep clicking it, but it's not making it bigger. But um, either way, I'll just watch the video. Um, and then if it's in the math uh, homework, then it'll be easier okay. to see uh, an example. What kind of device are you on, Mia? On a Dell laptop. A Dell. It should work on that. So um, I would maybe, because this is, we're going to be doing this all semester, and I want you to be able to see what I'm doing on the board. I don't want you to have to wait and watch it again. Are you, so, Mia, are you clicking on those little four squares up there on the upper right-hand corner? Mm, here, let me try to do that. And it, it'll tell you switch to Okay, it's switching to different people. Okay, while they're playing around with that, Jacob, Screen, you... um, Christina, uh, it's only... Okay, there it is. Okay, I got it. Thank you so much, Christina. Are you set, Mia? Welcome. Yay! Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. We solved the problem. I love that. Okay, Jacob, I see your hand is up. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, I have a job interview at 12.15, so mm -hmm. can I leave 15 minutes early? So, yeah, that's, you can, and then you can watch the rest of it on the recording, okay? All right, thank you. Okay, no problem. I'm recording at this point because 